we've discovered Kepler 22b, a small exoplanet in the Cygnus constellation. Seems like nothing important, right? But it's actually a big deal. This is the first planet located in the habitable zone that was found by the Kepler telescope. In other words, there may be water on this planet, and if there's water, there may be life. Kepler 22b can become our new potential home. So let's take a closer look at it. Actually, discovering new planets is not easy at all. Not all of them can be seen through our super cool telescopes, even the almighty Hubble. Sometimes the stars are so small and dim that it's really hard to find them on a map. The same thing happened with Kepler 22. In such cases, scientists have to use a special method. First, they take a bunch of photos of the star in different periods of time. Then, they look at them and think, hmm, are there any dark dots on this star somewhere? And if they find one, that might be a planet. These photos actually help us to discover some very important stuff. Like, first of all, this planet exists. Secondly, here is its size, radius, and proximity to the star. And finally, will we be able to live there? Now we know that Kepler 22b is very similar to our planet and could potentially become a second Earth. It's also very close to us, only 635 light years away. Yeah, it's about three quadrillion miles, but this is one of the closest options. Kepler 22, the star of Kepler 22b, is a yellow dwarf. It's very, very similar to our sun. The same size, the same radius, even the age is almost the same. 4 billion years. The difference is only in luminosity. It's about 20% dimmer than the sun. So, no matter how much you strain your eyes, you won't see this star in the night sky. The planet Kepler 22b is about 2.4 times larger than our Earth, and that's pretty good. More radius means more potential water and space to live. Although going from one city to another would take a while. It's scary to even imagine a three-day long plane flight. We don't know the exact mass of this planet, but scientists think it's bigger than Earth's. Actually, the mass of Kepler 22b can be up to 36 times greater than that of our planet. What does it mean? Vigorous gravity. If the planet is 36 times heavier than Earth, then gravity there will be about six times stronger. Can you barely lift 20 pounds of potatoes? Try 120. Not to mention that you yourself can become much heavier on that planet. You'll have to get incredibly pumped up just to walk there. You have to literally turn yourself into a bodybuilder just to get to work. The worst thing is that with such gravity, it'd be incredibly difficult for plants to survive there. They'd need at least a little freedom to rise up from the ground. And animals. Our dogs and cats would have to turn into little balls of muscle to survive there. But if this planet has its own animals or other inhabitants, we can roughly imagine what they may look like. They probably have a lot of legs to make moving easier. They aren't really tall, but they're very massive and extremely strong. Hmm, muscular giant spiders? Could be worse, I guess. The good news is that this is all unconfirmed information. If we're very lucky and gravity there turns out to be just a bit stronger than Earth's, then of course, it'll be much easier to live there. The next thing we know about Kepler 22b is that it's about 15% closer to its star than we are to the sun. If Kepler 22b existed in our solar system, it would be located somewhere between Earth and Venus. Does that mean we're all going to burn? No, silly. As I mentioned before, the star Kepler-22 is pretty cold, just some 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's why we can assume that the temperatures on Kepler-22b will be about the same as we have on Earth. If the planet orbits its star the same way Earth orbits the Sun, which we don't actually know, Kepler-22b can rotate around its star on its side, like, for example, Uranus. What? Didn't you know Uranus is actually lying on its side? Also, look at its rings. Yes, Uranus also has rings, like Saturn, but they're vertical. The universe is truly a mysterious place. So, 
If Kepler-22b is really something like that, then the weather on the planet will be, to put it mildly, not very good. Incredibly cold winters will be regularly followed by hot summers. And, just like with tidally locked planets, we'd be able to live more or less comfortably only on the narrow piece of land between these two crazy sides. Let's hope that this is not the case and the planet rotates normally. But it's not all that bad. Studies show that there may be an ocean on Kepler-22b. You already know that water means life, but in this case, it's also a big plus because a planet covered by an ocean always has more stable temperatures. The water absorbs some of the heat and distributes it evenly across the planet. The hot parts cool down and the icy ones warm up. By the way, that's exactly what happened to Earth billions of years ago. When our planet started getting its first little puddles, our beloved moon helped these puddles to spread all over the planet. Thanks to this, a burning horror that used to be our Earth turned into a cute little ball full of life. So if Kepler-22b has water but no atmosphere, scientists think that the average temperature there could be around 12 degrees Fahrenheit. But if there's also an Earth-like atmosphere, then the temperature can reach 72 degrees Fahrenheit. That would be nice. And finally, one year there is equal to 290 Earth days, about nine months. The planet has no natural satellites, so unfortunately, we'd have to say goodbye to a beautiful view of the moon. On the bright side, we'd probably be able to see the sun as a distant little star. We could admire it in the night sky, remembering our home, while not hiding from giant spiders. And this is all that we know at the moment. Unfortunately, it's quite difficult to explore such planets, so there's a lot of very important data that we don't know. For example, what kind of planet is this anyway? Yep, we're missing the most important information about Kepler-22b. We don't know if it's a rocky planet or not. And if not, then all the previously mentioned information means nothing. It may turn out to be a gas planet, or a planet covered with gas but with a solid core, like Neptune, or a water world covered with a giant ocean. In this case, it better be a water planet. Then at least we could build some kind of underwater city there. We could filter the water and eat fish until we evolve into an amphibious species. Does it even count as evolution if we go back to our roots? Scientists, however, think that Kepler-22b may turn out to be a Neptune-like planet. Some astronomers have even assigned the planet to a category of mini-Neptunes. Yes, this is a real planetary category. But this hasn't been proven yet. But even if, fortunately for us, Kepler-22b turns out to be a rocky planet, we still don't know what the atmosphere is like there. Does it exist at all? What if it turns out to be something like the atmosphere of Venus? which is more toxic than your ex. Then we'd have to dig deep underground to somehow survive on this planet. And then we'd have to come up with a heat source because it's pretty cold underground. Yeah, let's hope this won't be the case. There are many possibilities with Kepler-22b. So far, we don't have a clear answer, but let's hope that scientists will find it before we load the first people into shuttles and send them to conquer Kepler-22b. That would be awkward if it turns out to be a gas planet, or something like that. Have you ever thought about Earth itself as an intelligent, well, not creature, but maybe an entity? Like it has a mind and some survival instincts of its own. When said like this, it sounds like you're about to watch a fantasy movie where the planet we walk and live our daily lives on will suddenly wake up, realize it doesn't like us that much after all, and just go crazy. Hope not. But we're not actually talking about such scenarios. More of the idea that the collective activity of life, like microbes and plants, can change a planet and give it a life of its own. It's like the planet has a green mind. The metaphor of Earth as a living planet makes sense. Creatures across the globe crawl, swim, walk, and fly through the uppermost layers of our land, ocean, and sky. Plants cover much of our world. Plus, there are viruses and bacteria in the water, soil, and even atmosphere. 
Now imagine all the living things on Earth, like plants, animals, and microbes, as a giant team working together. They have different jobs, but they all do their thing to make the planet a better place to live. For example, plants make oxygen that we breathe, and animals help pollinate flowers. Together, they form the biosphere, which is like the Earth's team of life. That's where the idea of planetary intelligence comes in. Just like individuals and groups can be intelligent, so can an entire planet. Researchers believe we should measure the planet's intelligence by its ability to keep itself going forever. And just like how humans need to work together to survive, a planet's collective intelligence is measured by the capacity of all the life on it to work together towards this same goal. It's like the planet is a complex system that knows how to take care of itself, like forests. They can share nutrients through their secret underground networks of fungi. This helps all the trees stay healthy. We can obviously learn a lot from forests. If we jump into the fantasy universe while looking for intelligent, conscious planets, we definitely choose Mogo from Green Lantern. It's a specific planetary entity that can do things like changing its weather and altering gravity, plant growth, or some other surface conditions. Or how about the stunning Pandora from Avatar? Do you remember the fascinating scenes of flora and fauna there with organs that might remind you of tentacles? They enable creatures to interlink with each other on a neural level. It's like the entire planet is like one giant brain with many smaller trees, creatures, and its other pieces as its cells. We're far from that, but it's still nice to imagine. At the moment, our civilization is in the stage scientists named an immature technosphere. That means we're still too focused on using technology that doesn't always do good for our planet. We don't have a planetary intelligence or a collective understanding of what needs to be done to do better for our planet. Instead, we're all just doing our own thing. I mean, we're not at the worst stage. Researchers have come up with four stages of Earth's past and future to explain how planetary intelligence could impact the long-term future of humanity. The first stage is what we call the immature biosphere. It's when life first started on Earth, billions of years ago. Only microbes were there on the bare land without any vegetation. There wasn't any global feedback, which means these microbes couldn't yet affect Earth, its atmosphere, or other systems in any way. The second stage is the mature biosphere, which was 2.5 billion to 540 million years ago, when stable continents formed and the biosphere started to have a strong influence on the Earth. The third stage, known as immature technosphere, is where we are now with interlinked systems of communication, technology, transportation, electricity, and computers that draw resources from Earth's systems and affect the biosphere. The fourth stage, also known as the mature technosphere, is where Earth should aim to be in the future. It means technology will benefit the entire planet. We'll use sustainable forms of energy, like solar power. Planetary intelligence is the sign of a mature planet and researchers are trying to figure out how we can move towards it. So things we do on an individual level do matter. The collective activity of life, like microbes or plants, can change a planet and make it more than just a lifeless rock floating in space. Through the biosphere, our home planet kind of figured out how to host life by itself billions of years ago, and it's still going. Now we need to figure out how to have a similar kind of self-maintaining system, but this time with the technosphere. It's hard to imagine planets could generally become sentient, like Pandora, or some other imaginary conscious world out there. There are a few reasons for that. First, planets form based on how different materials like rocks, gases, and liquids gather around a new star. It's like you have a big family gathering where everyone brings different ingredients to make a delicious dish. And just like how these ingredients won't suddenly turn into a living being, the materials that make up a planet won't just turn into self-aware creatures. On Earth, after billions of years of complex chemical reactions, some molecules started to replicate themselves and carry information. That's how life on our planet began. 
and Earth is the only such example we have. Here's the second reason. Imagine you have a big garden where you plant a lot of mushrooms or bacteria, hoping they'll become really smart and help you take care of the garden. But mushrooms and bacteria don't have brains like we do. Eh, it's not like they need it anyway. Having a big brain is really expensive for animals too. It takes a lot of energy to keep it running. So animals only become as smart as they need to be to survive and thrive in their environment. Dogs and cats are pretty smart because they need to be able to avoid danger and find food. They don't need human kind of intelligence for things like building houses, creating art, or inventing new technologies. So it would be hard to bring all living beings and plants to the same level of intelligence. The third reason why it would be difficult for a planet to become sentient is the main rule of the animal kingdom. Life is all about survival of the fittest. Every creature is competing for resources, like water, food, and space. But not only do different species compete against each other, but individuals within the same species also fight. Just think of how fiddler crabs fight for territory on the beach, or how wolf packs fight over prey. Or me, when I see an empty spot on a crowded beach. This kind of competition is not a good base for global cooperation. There are a couple of exceptions to this rule. For example, ants. They may not be the brightest creatures on the planet, but when they come together in colonies, they can achieve amazing things, like gathering food that's way bigger than them, building nests, raising young, and even farming. In fact, they act like a super organism called a hive mind, where every ant works together towards a common goal. Insects like bees and ants are very altruistic and work together to ensure their queen reproduces. If one large ant colony took over our whole planet, it could act as a single mind and work towards the colony's and planet's interests until they run out of resources. But in reality, it's hard to imagine any organism, even a superorganism, could reach such a level of self-awareness and consciousness. Number 5. How could we keep in contact? When it comes to communication, ants use pheromones and humans use nerves. Both of these methods work well for small organisms, but when it comes to a giant planet-sized entity, it would be hard to make such communication fast and efficient. So communication within a planet-sized entity would be much slower than what we have in our homes, like our computers or smartphones. Oh well, we'll just continue dreaming about Pandora. You step on the surface of the moon. It's unusual. You definitely feel lighter here, and it's easier to walk. You decide to check out that obsessive idea of yours. Jump on Earth's natural satellite. And even despite your bulky spacesuit, you literally fly up into the air. Woohoo! Anyway, you continue your walk on the surface of the moon when you feel something strange. The ground under your feet is… is it shaking? It feels as if an earthquake has just started on the moon. But that's simply impossible. Or is it? Surprisingly, your gut feeling hasn't let you down this time. Moonquakes do exist. In fact, there are four types of moonquakes that are strong enough to be detected from a large distance. There are deep moonquakes occurring more than 430 miles below the surface. Then there are meteoroid impacts. Thermoquakes occur when the frigid lunar crust expands. It happens when the morning sun illuminates the satellite after a two-week-long deep freeze lunar night. And there are also shallow moonquakes. They're the only ones that are similar to earthquakes on our planet. Shallow moonquakes happen 12 to 19 miles below the surface, and they're the most powerful and dangerous. Between 1972 and 1977, the Apollo Seismic Network recorded 28 such moonquakes, and some of them measured more than 5 on the Richter scale. On Earth, such an earthquake is strong enough to crack plaster and move heavy furniture. Plus, shallow moonquakes are very long-lasting in compared to earthquakes. Once they get going, they can continue for up to 10 minutes. As for the average earthquake, it typically continues for 10 to 30 seconds. Scientists are still not sure what causes shallow moonquakes and even where exactly they occur. One of the theories is that moonquakes happen at the rims of large, relatively young craters that probably slump from time to time. Interestingly, 
the Moon and Earth aren't the only places where earthquakes occur. No, scientists have recorded quakes, tremors, vibrations, and shakes in other regions of our solar system, too. Let's take Mercury, for example. A few years ago, scientists discovered that this planet was shrinking, and that's why it seems to be so tectonically active. Or Venus. This world is a tectonic puzzle for experts. At the moment, Venus has no tectonic plates, and it might have never had them. But its surface has folds and faults and looks as if it could have tectonic plates. On the other hand, these features might have appeared because of other processes, for example, volcanic activity. But even though we haven't observed any Venus quakes, scientists believe they could detect them since their vibration seems to ripple through the thick atmosphere of the planet. Now, Mars. We know for sure that this planet is seismically active. NASA's lander placed a seismometer on the surface of the red planet. And in 2019, it managed to measure its first Mars quake. After that, the lander continued to record quakes. But they were so weak that if they happened on our planet, they'd be completely covered by the background noise of Earth's oceans. But a space body doesn't have to be a full-fledged planet to have active tectonics. Let's take Pluto. This dwarf planet is geologically active at the moment. In 2014, NASA's New Horizons spacecraft was flying through the Pluto system when it recorded complex geological features on this dwarf planet. Scientists concluded that Pluto might have quakes, or should I call them Pluto quakes, when its liquid water ocean freezes and thaws beneath the dwarf planet's icy crust. Jupiter's moons Europa and Io, as well as Saturn's moons Titan and Enceladus, are also geologically active despite their small size. Their features range from volcanoes and water plumes to potential subsurface oceans. Now, I bet you don't know these cool facts about earthquakes that occur on our planet. There's one place on Earth where a whopping 90% of all earthquakes occur. It's called the Ring of Fire, and it stretches around the Pacific Ocean from New Zealand all the way to South America. Hmm, looks to me more like a horseshoe. Anyway. Experts claim that these countless earthquakes are caused by the abundance of volcanoes in that region and the constant movement of the tectonic plates. Around half a million earthquakes happen on Earth every year, but many of them occur very, very deep in the Earth's crust, and only special equipment can detect them. We feel around 20% of earthquakes, and only 100 of them can cause damage. The largest recorded earthquake occurred in Chile in May 1960. It was a magnitude 9.5 on the Richter scale. It was truly devastating. During that earthquake, seismographs detected and recorded seismic waves that traveled all over the world. They shook the planet for many days. As for the most powerful earthquake that occurred in the US, it was 9.2 and happened in Alaska. By the way, Alaska, along with California, is the most earthquake-prone state in the US and one of the most seismically active regions in the world. A magnitude 7 earthquake occurs there almost every year. A mega-earthquake can actually shorten the length of a day for the entire planet. NASA claims that really large earthquakes can shift our planet's axis and, thus, change the duration of a day. Now, of course, you won't notice it since this change is measured in microseconds, and one microsecond is one millionth of a second. Scientists think that the 9.1 Sumatra earthquake, which occurred in 2004, shortened the day by 6.8 microseconds. Now, not even the best specialists can predict an earthquake. That's mostly because the mechanisms that trigger earthquakes are extremely deep underground. But these days, people have learned how to figure out a more precise time frame of when an earthquake might occur. Earthquakes can be triggered by volcanic eruptions or, let's say, meteor impacts. But most of them are caused by the movements of our planet's tectonic plates. Earth's surface consists of 15 to 20 constantly moving tectonic plates. Pressure increases when they shift, and this can make the crust of our planet break. San Francisco is moving toward Los Angeles right at this moment. The speed of its movement is about 2 inches per year. That's as fast as your fingernails grow. It's happening because the two sides of the San Andreas Fault, which is the continental fault extending 750 miles through California, are slipping past each other. So, in several million years, Los Angeles and San Francisco will be neighbors. 
lakes, ponds, and canals become slightly warmer and start to stink before an earthquake. It happens because gases get released when tectonic plates shift. Most animals feel these signs and change their behavior. For example, scientists noted toads completely disappearing before an earthquake in Italy in 2009. But as soon as the natural disaster was over, they returned. Even after an earthquake is over, you might still see water sloshing around in your swimming pool. There's no need to worry. This is a phenomenon called a seiche. The water can keep sloshing around for hours after the earthquake is over. For example, the pool at the University of Arizona lost some water from a seiche caused by an earthquake in Mexico that occurred 1,200 miles away. On February 27, 2010, a massive earthquake started in Chile. It measured 8.8 on the Richter scale. As a result, Earth's crust in that region was ripped so dramatically that a city called Concepcion moved 10 feet to the west. Another earthquake resulted in the tallest mountain in the world, Everest, shrinking by one inch. It happened in 2015 when a magnitude 7.5 earthquake caused several Himalayan mountains to decrease in size. The Japanese used to believe that earthquakes were caused by Namazu, a giant catfish that lived submerged in the mud under the Japanese islands. The fish would thrash about, causing seismic activity. As for the ancient Greeks, they were sure that a powerful sea deity, Poseidon, produced earthquakes by hitting his trident against the earth when he was angry. According to Hindu mythology, eight elephants hold earth in place. They are, in turn, balanced on the back of a ginormous turtle, standing on the coils of an even larger snake. And every time any of these animals moves, an earthquake occurs.